MedCram. Okay, well, welcome to another MedCram lecture. We're going to talk today about shock. There's different types of shock. We're going to talk about all three. One is called hypovolemic shock. Then you've got cardiogenic shock, and you've got septic shock. We're going to go through these three different types of shock, how they're different, and why you need to know them. Well, what I want to do is kind of diagram out what it is I'm talking about. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is draw some compartments because that's going to be very important. The first thing I want to draw is the vascular or the compartment. And this is where basically the blood is stored. Okay, then it goes into the vasculature, which is then goes into the heart. Once you understand these things, I think it's going to be a lot easier to understand. And then there's a decision that's made, a choice, where it can either go to the vital organs or the non-vital organs. Okay, so we got vital organs here. And then we've got the non-vital organs. What is a non-vital organ? Well, something like skin would fit into that category. It's kind of vital, but not absolutely essential. The body's got to make a decision at some point about where blood is going to go if there's not enough of it to go around. And then, of course, everything goes right back to where it's being held. Okay, so we've got the vasculature, and this is sort of the storehouse of blood. It's primarily in the venous system, and so this is where you can have problems. And so we'll call this A, okay? Next is B, which is the heart. And then finally last is C, which is the vasculature. And so these are the three areas that really contribute to shock. So let's figure out what's happening in the normal system. So you've got blood, blood goes to the heart. The heart then pumps blood to the non-vital and the vital organs. And why does this happen? This happens because you need oxygen. Oxygen needs to get to these organs. Otherwise, these organs will go into shock. So what is shock? Shock is a situation where the vital organs are not getting oxygen. If vital organs don't get oxygen, your body will go into shock because these organs will shut down. And if they shut down, if more than three of these organs shut down, there's a very high mortality associated with this. And so not only are we going to talk about the different types of shock, but we're going to talk about the different ways of fixing shock in these specific organ systems. But it's important for you to get a kind of a sense about what's going on. You've got blood. Blood goes to the heart. The heart then pumps that blood. And it's important because that blood, the hemoglobin molecule specifically, is binding to oxygen and taking that oxygen molecule to the target tissues. Now, why do these target tissues need oxygen? You may recall from biochemistry that oxygen is needed as the final electron acceptor so that the electron transport chain can continue to function and FADH2, NADH gets transported across and you get protons pumped into the intermembrane space, which then come back into the matrix of the mitochondria to make ATP. If you don't make ATP, you're dead. Okay, basically. So your target tissues need oxygen. So there are three places where that can break down. A, if you don't have enough blood, that can cause a problem and you'll eventually get into shock because there's not enough oxygen reaching the organs. B, if your heart is just not strong enough to pump that blood to your organs. And finally, C, kind of a septic shock or distributive shock, if there's a problem here in the way the body regulates how much blood goes to the vital and non-vital organs. 
So in other words, if it starts messing up and things start going this way and less going this way, that can be a problem and that can cause less oxygen to go to your vital organs. So three different possibilities. Okay, now I want to break this down so you can see the differences. First of all, I'm going to make a column here. And we're going to have three different columns. And we're going to have eight different rows. And we'll see if we can get all of this in here so you can understand. Okay, so there are three different types of shock. The first type of shock is what we call hypovolemic shock. So I'm going to make that red because that has to do with blood. Hypovolemic. You can follow along here on your piece of paper. Now, hypovolemic has to do with letter A. That's where there's a problem at A. There's not enough blood. There's just not enough blood. And so let's go ahead before we go through all of these and quickly label what I want to talk about here. We're going to talk about some issues. CO is the cardiac output. HR is the heart rate. SVR is systemic vascular resistance. It's kind of the resistance right here, SVR. What is the resistance to flow in these blood vessels? That's what SVR basically is. EF is the ejection fraction. It's how much blood does the heart pump out. It's a surrogate for basically how strong is the heart beating. Then we have something called the post-capillary wedge pressure. This is this is measured by something called the right heart catheter. It's where you float a balloon into the pulmonary artery and there's a little tip distal to that balloon that can measure what the pressure is in the pulmonary artery when there's no more pulsation coming from the right ventricle. This is a surrogate for the pressure in the pulmonary capillary, which is a surrogate for the pressure in the pulmonary vein, which is a surrogate for basically the pressure in the left atrium. So when you see pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, I really want you to think left atrium because that's really what it's measuring. Next one is JVP. That's the jugular venous pulse. When you see that, I want you to think right atrium. Then we've got blood pressure. And then finally, skin, the temperature. Okay, let's go through these then. And I think this will be very instructive to figure out what happens in hypovolemic shock. So in hypovolemic shock, you've got a lot of bleeding. You've bled out uh, from an accident, from a GI bleed. Something's going on. And so what's the first thing that you're going to see? Well, the first thing you'll see is that your jugular venous pressure is low. And that makes sense. Jugular venous pressure is measured right here. If you don't have a lot of blood, obviously the pressure is going to be low. If your pressure going into your heart is low, just from the Starling's forces, if your preload is low, your cardiac output is going to be low. As a result, your heart's going to try to compensate, so your heart rate is going to go up. Then what's going to happen? Because it'll compensate, at some point it's not going to compensate anymore. It's going to go get worse and worse, and your blood pressure is going to start to go down. As a result of that, your ejection fraction may go up to compensate. But as the blood pressure goes down, your systemic vascular resistance is going to go up. Now, this is important. If the cardiac output's low right here, okay, and your blood pressure is low, then these arteries are going to try to squeeze together to bring the blood pressure up so there's enough pressure to reach the non-vital and the vital organs. That's why the SVR or the systemic vascular resistance goes up. Now you can imagine if there's not enough volume circulating, both your right atrial pressure and your left atrial pressure are going to be low. Now here's the important thing. Because the pressure's low, 
and systemic vascular resistance is increasing, which one do you think is going to increase more? Is it going to increase more the blood going to the vital organs or more going to the non-vital? Well, you're right. It's going to actually shunt a lot of the blood towards the vital organs and it's going to close off the non-vital like the skin. And so therefore, your skin temperature is going to be cool. It's going to be low. So that's what happens in hypovolemic shock. Okay, let's talk about cardiogenic shock. We'll make that green. Cardiogenic shock. That's B. That's where we are here at B. Okay, so what's the primary problem with cardiogenic shock? The primary problem is the heart's just not working, and your cardiac output is going to be low. So that's where it's starting. Notice we're starting in a different place here. The problem is not not enough volume. The problem is there's not enough cardiac output. As a result of that, the heart rate may speed up. Unless, of course, the thing that's causing your cardiogenic shock is something like beta blockers, and therefore your heart rate would be low. So it just depends on what's causing your cardiogenic shock. Uh, and that's going to be the thing that causes it to have problems. So when that happens, what do you think is going to happen to the pressure of fluid behind the heart? Well, if the heart's not pumping, everything's going to back up. And so both your left atrial pressure and your right atrial pressure are both going to go up. Because you're in cardiogenic shock, however, your blood pressure is going to go down. Now, what do you think is going to happen to your systemic vascular resistance? Well, again, because your heart is having a problem pumping blood, your blood vessels are going to do the same thing. Your blood vessels don't know the difference between whether it's the heart not pumping or just not having enough blood. They're going to do the same thing. And so systemic vascular resistance is going to go up. Your ejection fraction, obviously, because you're in cardiogenic shock, is going to be low. And what's going to be your skin temperature? Once again, since you're having constriction here, and you're getting a shunting of blood from the non-vital to the vital organs, your skin temperature is going to be cold. Okay, so let's take a moment to notice what the difference is between hypovolemic and cardiogenic shock. Everything else is the same, really, except for the fact that these indices go up versus go down. So if you can measure the JVP, that would be a great way of determining if someone is in hypovolemic or cardiogenic shock. Okay, let's talk about septic shock. Now septic shock is a lot different. Septic shock is caused by an infection. And when you have an infection, you've got an immune response against that. Well, something funny happens when you get that immune response. That immune response, or these antibodies or cells, we'll have them down here as cells, they release cytokines and chemokines and all of these sorts of, of, of things. And what do they do? They cause dysregulation of vasoconstriction here that we, where we've been talking about at the arterioles both going to the non-vital and vital organs. And basically what happens is because there's dysregulation and specifically vasodilation, okay, so opening up, widening, there is this shunting of blood, if you will, to non-vital organs away from the vital organs. So where's the problem? The problem starts off here at the systemic vascular resistance. Systemic vascular resistance plummets. It drops. And that's a big problem. And as a result of that, you have compensation. So in other words, if this thing opens up and the pressure just drops, which you'll see, blood pressure drops in septic shock, that causes a compensatory increase in heart rate and an increase in cardiac output, at least early on in septic shock. The ejection fraction, because of the infection actually is stunned and it drops somewhat okay and as a result of of the increased cardiac output the post capillary wedge pressure actually drops and so does your jugular venous pulse it also drops now because there's dysregulation here and blood is going to the skin believe it or not your skin temperature is actually up and it, these patients actually feel very warm so notice here that whereas in cardiogenic shock, your post-capillary wedge pressure and jugular venous pulse was high, 
In septic shock, it's low. So what I would recommend is studying these, looking them over and over, so you can see quickly the differences. Skin temperature is very important. Sometimes you can just walk into a room and touch the patient and look up on the monitor and see that they've got a fast heart rate and see that their blood pressure is low. And just by simply touching the skin and feeling if it's very warm, you can tell if this patient's in septic shock. Although it's not 100%, of course, and there's other things that you should look at. But the key here is, is that there are certain readings that you'll see depending on the type of shock that you're in. And knowing where everything starts off, you'll be able to fill in the rest of the blanks. So there's another lecture coming up talking about how we treat septic shock and using something called early goal directed therapy. Early goal directed therapy, and that's very important. It's been shown to save lives. We'll talk about why it's important to, to use early goal directed therapy. All right, thanks for joining me.